I didn't want to um, catch all that gushing from my end on the recording. So now it's all you, Tanya. <laughs> Um, so I just want to chime in that both Elliot and Liana are trying to get on, but they say they're in the waiting room and aren't oh. being in. Right. Okay, who's who's the host here, Clay? Hey, you managed to you managed to con get control of this thing. I'm admitting all, admitting all. Okay, um, is there a way I can get rid of your guys' faces on the side so I can see some of my slides? No. Yeah, if you hit that little minus. You see at the top of the bar, at the top oh, of the face bar, there's oh, a nice takes okay. everybody away. Not that we don't all want to look at ourselves close up. <laughs> it's I pretty amazing really since I'm probably the oldest one here. Yes, I'm in my room Zoom, right? on Kauai. Okay. Get that and so, it'll go away. All right, let's get the show on the road. Okay, yeah, thanks, Clay, it, for guys. the intro. Yep. How about Elliot? Is he in? Elliot's in. Okay. I'm muting everybody myself. Here? All right, can I go? I'm muting. I'm hit. Take it away, Tanya. All right, okay, thanks everyone for being here. Okay, so like Clay said, uh, this project started really as a kind of an offshoot of my graduate assistantship that I helped um, kind of redo this grazing plan for, um, starting my stopwatch here, this grazing plan for Puawa. And uh, so basically what they wanna do at Puawa is use targeted cattle grazing along a roadside to raise fire promoting grasses to reduce fire risk to protect endangered native dry forests. And um, so I just want to lay it down right here at the beginning. Uh, the purpose of this project is to protect native forests. I know cows and forests don't mix, but it's to protect native forests and that grazing is the most effective fire control method over large spatial areas. So, and the science is pretty firm on that one. So two objections, two objectives for this uh, work here. I'm looking at the historic context, cultural and uh, historic context of grazing in Hawaii. I wanna see where it came from and how it got to where it is now, because that's important. And also identify barriers to uh, the proposed grazing that uh, targeted grazing that they wanna do at Puawa. Some of these things I looked at already in the grazing assessment, but uh, this kind of just takes it off on a tangent there. So the overview of this whole talk here, I'm gonna do some background and then I'm gonna do a historic overview of cattle ranching in Hawaii. Then look at the current barriers that the ranchers have now at Puawa, what could prevent them from doing this targeted grazing. Then I'm gonna go, there's, there's really two parts to this study, the qualitative interviews, where I'm gonna to try to identify values that people have associated with these uh, grasslands and dry forests. So really one and the same, the grasslands are former dry forests, but they're all over the state, not just at Puawa. And then I'm gonna do a quantitative survey where I try to see if I can get these values, see if there's any stakeholders that come out of these values, stakeholder groups. And really stakeholders are just the groups of people that care about something and they can change a project. So like, do they care about anything? Uh, and most importantly, do they care about what something that may affect um, Puawa's um, proposed grazing? And then I'll also, look at any barriers implementing to targeting, the, doing this targeted grazing at Puawa. A little background, ungulates in Hawaii introduced in the 1790s, um, cows, goats, sheep, whatever, spread over the islands quickly, decimated the native forests. Uh, this picture down here, oh yeah, I need to get my laser pointer. Um, the picture down here on the right side, here, that's Puawa. So the dark green are trees, and the light green are grasses and so these and after the forest you know eating up noxious weeds come in and these are fire promoting grasses here so um and we also have a bunch of uh, abandoned ag land especially in since the late 80s the the um, sugarcane plantations went under the last one went under a few years ago and so you have over a million acres of abandoned rangelands that are just grasses and shrubs and they burn ready to burn, some of them have been burning. There's about 800,000 acres of rangeland throughout the state that's available for grazing right now. So this is a, this is a huge, huge part of the state. And as far as the, the tropical dry forests, like these are our most um, endangered and uh, diverse forests in the state. Puawa has the largest remnant that's left and uh, they're culturally significant. So these, are, these forests are precious and we really need to do the best we can to protect them and the greatest threat to these forests right now are fire. And I know cattle have done a number on these forests, but it's a, it's the fire now that's really the greatest threat. So 
a little background on the fire grass cycle. So what happens is that the Hawaiian native forests are not acclimated to fire. So you get these fire promoting grasses, catch fire, the fire moves into the forest, the forest burns. And what comes back in these dry forests is more grass. And so it just replaces the dry forests over time even without human intervention. And, and Hawaii, uh, fires in Hawaii are increasing. So this large, uh, the image of the state here, all these little pukas here, all these little dots, those are in, uh, fire um, ignitions. Almost all of them are human caused and by the roadside. We're also having more fire because of drought. And this little chart down here on the right, this is a year. And this is just shows us that there's increasing fire uh, acreage burned over time in Hawaii. And so, also because of drought, because of uh, abandoned ag ag agricultural lands as well. So a little bit on the grazing and fire control, like I mentioned at the beginning, that science is pretty firm that this um, grazing it re reduces the grass height, which reduces the flame length, but it also reduces the grass continuity. So this photo on the right here, that's at Puawa, just solid grass. And so this photo down here is an experimental plot where they had grazed and um, mowed and unmowed areas they set fire what the fire does is it goes through the taller grasses and when it gets to the shorter stuff it just starts to creep and so that gives time for a fire su su suppression to get there and uh, so again what Puawa wants to do is graze heavily along the roadside this is a photo of Puawa of heav heavily grazed areas here and ungrazed so there's a big difference there this photo is on Oahu of a fire that burned uh, this was ungrazed area grasses real high grasses and it the fire stopped on its own at this fence line where you had grazed grasses. So basically the, um, the, the fire, fire and, and grazing competes for the same thing, which is grass. So it's, it's either gonna be eaten or burned <laughs> basically. So uh, a little background on Puawa itself. Okay, it's on the Big Island, North Kona area uh, up here. It, there's the Big Island, that's where it's Puawa is at. This is a map of the Ahopua. So this is Malka, this is Makai. On the top of the map is Makai. So it goes up to about 6,000 feet up of Walai. And what you wanna look at here is this little red line that goes through here. That is the road that runs through Puawa. And this map here on the right is a fire frequency map that tells us that um, the red is the most important thing you want to look at. That is the greatest fire frequency, but will burn about every 10 to 15 years. And the road goes right through that. So huge fire is there. Uh, and again, the, the tropical dry forest, most of it's in the upper elevations. There's scattered plots here and there. It is historically grazed, um, but it has a number of endangered species. Uh, so the map down here with this proposed grazing strip, again, that's the road passing through Puawa. This green is where they want to graze along the roadside. It's like a minimum of 50 meters or so. Um, and this, uh, these other colored polygons, those are current or planned exclosures where they're going to fence out uh, ungulates, including cattle. So like this one here along the road, the cattle aren't going to be in there. Um, so they're just going to be along this area. And when you're doing targeted grazing, you're, you're not just letting the cows go. You're, you're moving them in there, it depends on it's a, a specific time and specific places, depending on the fire risk, the height of the grass, um, so forth. Uh, this white area that is currently grazed. And so what they're doing at Puawa is they're trying to plant native forests as fast as they can, but it's really slow work. And in the meantime, you have all these acres of grasslands that are ready to burn. And so the cattle are just keeping that down for now. So uh, the overview of my qualitative analysis, these are the interviews, economic analysis. Um, and the, so the objectives here is to do the historic cultural context of grazing in Hawaii. Where has it been? Where is it now? And also kind of, where is it going? And then what are the barriers to implementing um, this grazing plan at Puawa? So I want to look at, you know, how do people value these grazing lands? Or, or not? How do they value these grasslands um, and these uh, native, uh, these dry, dry forest rangelands and remnant dry forest? So the methods for this, uh, again, I'm doing economic analysis with the ranchers at Puwawa. It involved interviews, also cattle XL worksheet where I look at their books. 
And then I also did in-depth interviews with about 100 people from around the state, mostly from the Puawa, uh, involved with Puawa. And uh, two methods there, a snowball sampling, and which is I talk to this person, they tell me talk to that person, and they tell me talk to another person. And convenience sampling is whoever I run into. So, uh, and that those two methods are good for like small insular communities, um, like ranchers. Uh, so this focused on aspects of management of uh, Puawa. You know, like, and I wanted to know how do people group themselves, but also how do they group others, and especially in relationship to the dry forest conservation and rangeland management in Hawaii. <clears throat> so the results of the cattle, the history of cattle production in Hawaii. So this information comes from uh, multiple cited sources and documents, if you want those talk to me later. But so basically an overview of this is cattle introduction in 1793. There was a 20, 20 year, sorry, I'm sucking on cough drop, so I don't cough here. There's a 20 year um, kapu on the cattle. They were allowed to spread throughout the state. They were moved from island to island. And uh, kapu just means a prohibition on killing them. Well, after that 20 years, it became a problem. So um, Native Hawaiians in the dry land areas, they lived off of dry land um, farms. The, the cattle got in there and just ate up their farms. And so these people had to either leave that area or adapt. Um, they put rock walls around the farms, cattle knocked down the rock walls. Some Hawaiian families started ranching, herding animals. Um, but there were cases of, uh, these were mostly longhorns, very aggressive. They were chasing people, they were killing people. Uh, there was re reports of overgrazing in Nuuanu Valley on Oahu was causing silting in of Honolulu Harbor. There was a 20-year period where they tried to hunt these cows to, um, to reduce the number, and that didn't work. And uh, then there's a description of how the forests in Waimea were killed off by these cows, and it changed the Waimea on the Big Island, and it changed the precipitation and the wind patterns. So it was pretty significant destruction of the native ecology by cows. So in the 1830s, the king requested uh, vaqueros from Mexican California to come and teach Mexican style ranching to Hawaiians. And uh, this was effectively, a, it was a means of dealing with an invasive species. And so they started branding these cows and herding them. And then in 1848, you had the great Mahele, which uh, the, means that land went from private, or sorry, land went from communal ownership to private. And so this, enabled large uh, land holdings to come together. And so people that were grazing on communal lands, they were unable to do so. So some of these folks adapted by just working for the ranchers. So you had the rise of these large ranches. This also enabled plantations. So the plantations brought in people from East Asia, Portugal, around the world. Some of these folks that came in, they, wanted to, they didn't like the plantation life, went to work for ranches. So you had this melange of different cultures coming together, this Hawaiian, Spanish influence mixing with people from Japan and, and Portugal and so forth. And you had this, this culture that evolved out of this, this Paniolo culture, Paniolo meaning um, cowboy in Hawaiian. And so ranches, Hawaii was self-sufficient in beef for, uh, for a good time until the 1900s thing, things started to go downhill. In the late 1900s, cheaper beef from the mainland, especially after statehood. Uh, and like in the 1980s, about 30% of the state's beef was supplied locally. And then that went down to less than 10% uh, in the 2000s. So, <clears throat> and there's evidence now that people are, uh, some of the ranchers that are still doing it are doing it for heritage reasons because it's less profitable. So looking at the economic barriers for the people ranching at Puwawa now, I mean, they have to pay for, they do lease the land for really cheap because it's um, public lands. And I forgot to mention Puwawa is managed by Department of Land and Natural Resources with, um, uh, they, they do have some input from Citizens Group Puwawa Advisory Committee. Um, but anyways, they, the ranchers pay for infrastructure. So fencing, gates, water, if they use well water, that's really expensive. Um, so one rancher, for instance, this is a this photo here is a trough with about 24 goats drinking out of it, drank about a third of his water, we think, uh, just a basic estimate. And these goats, for the month I had up this camera, the goats were there like constantly and the cows would come in the morning and leave. So they also have poor forage quality. So like fountain grass is, is the main grass slower down that's um, 
flammable, that's really poor quality for cows. They got to have supplemental feed. So with this um, economic analysis I did, and this this photo is just a image of when I was going over grazing rotations with the ranchers, they draw on the map where they move the cows. But <clears throat> I found that the ranchers at Puawa don't make a profit, which begs the question, well, why are they ranching? Because uh, this is really difficult work. So what value are they obtaining from this labor besides profit? And that led me, this question led me to, well, first of all, I couldn't do the benefit cost analysis I wanted to do before, but this led to questions of, what are the values associated with this place in general? So that I went to do, uh, I started doing more interviews. This led me to the interviews and this led me to the historic um, research on the, the history of ranching in Hawaii. It's like, where did ranching come from? Why is it at this place now? Why are these guys grazing and not making a profit? So the results from the interviews. Um, <clears throat> so these were unstructured interviews, interviewed about 100 people, and these were emerging values that came up consistently. Uh, they, they, the, the people I interviewed kind of sorted themselves into these values and sorted others into these values. And so there's some quotes here from these interviews I did. One of the ranchers, I asked him, what would make you give up ranching? And he said, I wouldn't give this up for anything. He was really passionate about it. Uh, his, that's Paniolo heritage is what he identified with. A lot of folks from the conservation community I'd bring up, oh yeah, I'm doing this work on using targeted cattle grazing at, at Puawa to reduce fire risk. And one of the first questions that come up was, why not goats? A very common question, why not goats? And so suggested, okay, folks maybe aren't as comfortable with cattle. Um, other uh, quotes that came up from a self-described local vor who loved going to farmer's markets and eating local food. She cherished eating food raised by people she knew. Um, a volunteer from, she described urban Kona at Puawa. She told me she felt a, connect, a connection to nature there. And she really loved being at Puawa. <clears throat> and then uh, one hunter told me that uh, he thought that forest restoration is a backdoor excuse to eliminating hunting. Um, <laughs> this this sentiment was expressed by a number of folks that supported hunting. There's, and it showed a distressed distrust for um, native forest conservation and um, and a strong support for hunting. And Interestingly, the, it showed a distress also for UH and even for the research I was doing from some folks. And then uh, one of the ranchers told me, his old timer, a non Hawaiian rancher, and he said, I asked him, How do you know when to move your cows to rotate? And he said, You just have to listen to the land. The land will tell you when to move your cows. So th these values hunting, local food production, native forest conservation. Uh, Native Hawaiian values, outdoor recreation, Paniolo heritage, and rural lifestyle were the seven values that I tweezed out of these interviews. So as far as ranching in Hawaii today, um, well, first of all, it, cattle grazing requires outside income and labor to supplement it. You either have a, a, your spouse has a job or you have a job on the side or you have retirement or, um, you know, uh, weekends when you have Roundup, all your friends and family help for free, <laughs> help you help you do the work. Um, as far as the economic analysis, I found that at Puawa it's, it is unprofitable. And I looked at some of the larger statewide data um, in the last 30, 20 years or so, we've had a significant decrease in the large herds in the state and a huge rise in small herds, like one to six cows, which suggests subsistence herding. And we also, the cows are smaller when they're um, slaughtered, which suggests that they're being finished on smaller acreage as well, grass fed. Also the remaining large ranches are diversifying. They're, they're doing dude ranches, they're doing ATV rides and zip lines. Um, like Kualoa Ranch does all kinds of stuff, right? They have movie tours, tours everywhere. Um, they Cattle ranching there, the cattle is the smallest aspect of their business model. They, you can see the cows on their, their farm to table tour and then have beef for dinner. They slaughter like eight cows a month, so. Um, yeah, so many people do consider uh, continue ranching for heritage heritage reasons. And as far as the the, the Paniolo heritage in in Hawaii, um, it's really a hybrid of both indigenous Hawaiian and non Hawaiian influence. It's kind of like a, a Hapa Haole foodway. It's a non-native 
food, you have some of these Native Hawaiian families seem to be approaching it from an, from an Indigenous perspective as far as sharing the labor, sharing the, the spoils of that labor, the, the beef amongst one another. Uh, like on the weekends, the families will come together and they'll, they'll work the cattle. And then, uh, you know, when that, when the cows are slaughtered, beef will be shared through various social networks. And it really reminded me of some of the research that Mehana did on the sh sharing networks with fish from uh, Hyena on, on Kauai. Um, and then also in the wider Hawaiian culture, Paniolo heritage is part of Hawaii. It, it has influenced Hawaiian music, attire, rodeos are gaining popularity. There's, there's museums, there's festivals, there's um, celebrations, there's musical productions, there's plays done to celebrate the, the Paniolo heritage. This is a, this photo here is, is a, from Waimea on the big island, of just um, statues of Paniolos. So, <clears throat> And also, I point out, most of us know Hawaii imports 90% of our food. This Paniolo heritage, the cattle grazing does provide some local food production in addition to this heritage. So, and we are losing the fight with fire, so hopefully grazing can help with that. But the, the heritage seems kind of underappreciated. I don't know. It's, but I also want to bring up this tension between hunting and conservation that most of us in the conservation field are aware of, but it's not well documented. Um, and the hunters I spoke to, I mean, the reason hunt, they're, they have a problem with restoration is when you restore something, when you restore native forests, you fence out the ungulates. You got to remove the ungulates. So that removes that area from hunting. And some of these hunters that have been doing this for several generations, they learned to hunt from their father and grandfather in this area. And it's becomes this, I, or strong personal identity. Uh, some of the indigenous, the native Hawaiian hunters look at it as a native gathering, right? Um, so a lot of them feel really threatened by conservation. They feel like hunting in the state of Hawaii is basically endangered. For, from a conservation view, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's like, dude, you want to, you know, restore the forest. You got to remove the ungulates. We shouldn't have any ungulates in, in our forest reserves at all, including Pua'a. So, um, very opposing viewpoints. The, I also want to point out in my interviews, these two groups, people that support hunting and forest conservation had the strongest opinions uh, in the interviews. And when I did my survey, people that supported these two were the only ones that contacted me about the survey, either by phone or email or contacted me or one of my advisors. And they were, they were passionate about their, their issue. <laughs> um, <clears throat> an overview on the quantitative analysis, <clears throat> excuse me. So I have these people sort of themselves into these values. I want to know these seven values, if I can derive stakeholders groups from them. And so stakeholder is just, you know, like I said, people that care about something, what do they care about and why? Um, so for this quanti quantitative survey, there were three aspects to it. I did, it had a couple demographic questions. And then I had uh, two main questions. Uh, where I collected data for this. Uh, one was the method was called proportional piling. It weights the seven values. So it's a valuating exercise. And then also a scenario exercise um, where I, I asked them to basically gave us three management scenarios and asked them to fund these three scenarios. And that's using the analytic hierarchy process. So for the, the valuating exercise, again, these are the seven values pulled out of these interviews. And I told the um, folks taking the survey, okay, you got 28 points. Allocate these 28 points to these seven values. Each value must have a number. So you can give all 28 points to one value and zero to the others, or you can even, even them out to four uh, points each. And what this forces the person to choose which value they value the most in relative to the other values. <clears throat> and this is the management scenario. So basically I gave, I gave them this, this hypothetical scenario. I tried to um, try to simplify it as best I could because it's complicated, uh, but also um, not make it too complicated. And, and I had, complaints about both. <laughs> so I think I hit the sweet spot there. Um, uh, but anyways, uh, gave people a budget and said, okay, you're going to 
manage this this piece of land it's grasslands you want to restore the forest but it, there's a risk of it burning every year um so they gave him fifty thousand dollars and i said how are you going to spend that money you got th these are the costs for putting um you're going to put money towards restoration cattle restoration when you plant native trees it reduces the fire risk right because they don't burn as much you can also graze to reduce fire risk by cattle, which cattle are primarily also used as food and they trample the grasses. Or you can also graze by goats, which aren't as used as food as much. They don't trample the grasses. Uh, these prices, the costs are taken from research as well as interviews. And uh, the goats, it comes from uh, quotes I got from some of the goat grazers guys. So the, the Data, data analysis for the these um, surveys. So I had three methods. Two were exploratory analysis components, <clears throat> and that's a principal component analysis. And then I also did these histograms, where I looked at the um, raw distribution of funding allocated across the the three scenarios, and I pulled out four histograms for that. And then also I did a statistical analysis using generalized linear models. <clears throat> so the generalized linear models is going to that a little bit more. Um, so basically the question is we want to look at, can, can we use the points allocated to these seven values to predict where, the, where they're going to put their money? Are they going to fund goats, uh, goat grazing, cow grazing, or forest restoration? So uh, the the response variable, so that's just the proportion of funds given to one of the scenarios, and and we did this three times, one for each management scenario, and the predictor value, those are the seven values, and these were again weighted using that point system, that proportional pie line, right? Um, and then I also use multi-model inference based on ICACA information criterion, uh, AIC, and then we uh, did. Um, model coefficients and to compare the relationship to each of the seven predictors and those are the seven values so this model here at the bottom this big thing that's just the seven values that's our a global model um, using all possible predictors including the null this one is for conservation so we do this for conservation one for cattle and one for goat grazing so the results um as, far as demographics uh, folks are a little older than state average and more people from the Big Islands. All the counties were um, represented here, and especially on the Big Island. But as far as uh, gender, it was about the same. Uh, of the 500 people, 482 answered all the questions. Again, a number of people skipped the last one because they thought it was either too, comp they thought it was too complicated. <laughs> um, principal component analysis. So this is how people sort themselves across those seven values. So if you look at this here, so these red words, that's just the seven values, outdoor recreation, native forest conservation. Sorry, Chris, someone's cut off there. These black numbers, that's the participant number. And so the, these axes here, that just is just maximizes the difference in the largest factors in the data, whatever factors those were. So the direction of these arrows directionality um it's a relationship of the values to each other so if they're pointing in the same direction like hunting rural lifestyle pineal heritage kind of clustered if you put values for hunting you're likely to put put uh, value uh, rural lifestyle but if you value if, if you put more numbers towards this value native forest conservation you're less likely to give them you know put Pineal heritage and rural lifestyle uh, value that. Then, um, if it's at, at a 90 degree angle, which is this almost is here, that means between native forest conservation and native Hawaiian culture, there's no relationship. So, if you give points to native forest conservation, um, there's no relationship to whether you give points to native Hawaiian culture or not. Then, the strength of these arrows, that's just a, the or the length, that's the strength of the directionality or the, the how well they cluster. So like this short little arrow here is local food production. That means that people don't cluster around that value very well. It, it could mean that a lot of people valued it but just gave small numbers to it. 
So the results of the <clears throat> the stakeholders. So I did, like I said, four histograms, and um, these are four groups derived from these clusters. So I looked at of all the seven values, uh, people that allocated a number eight or more to that value. Um, I, I looked at if there were which values had at least 30 respondents that gave a value of eight or more. And there were four values in which I had at least 30 respondents that gave a uh, allocated eight points or more to that value. And so I did histograms on those. Let's just look at the raw distribution of funding. Where were the, these people that were valued, these, these particular va values the most, where were they putting their money? So in these histograms, I got uh, the, the, the x-axis is the funding and the y is the, the density. Uh, so the first one, we have four. So people that strongly value conservation, remember they're given eight points or more to, to force conservation. So these, this here, so green is putting money towards restoration, red is cattle, and black is goats. And down here, on, again, on the x-axis is funding. So 50,000 was the max money that you had to fund, allocate. And a lot of them gave all their 50,000 to restoration here, and they did not fund cattle that much and really didn't like goats. So again, with Hawaiian culture, similar to the previous one, but not as extreme, they did give more of their money to restoration. They gave some to cattle too. Gave less to cattle, but a lot less to goats. And for folks that really valued hunting, they gave most of their funds to cattle and gave very little to restoration and even less to goats. So these guys, this was the most extreme difference here. They really didn't like restoration. Um, and they preferred cattle. For people that support, have a strong support for local food production, and again, I forgot to mention that it's a number of participants down here, so 70 people. Um, they didn't seem to really care. They didn't have a preference for spending money on cattle or um, restoration, but they didn't really, they didn't like goats either. Like nobody put, nobody put money, a lot of money to goats. Um, <laughs> so the results for the, Generalized linear models. So, for multi-model selection, what what we did is we looked at um, best supported models for these three management scenarios for cattle restoration and goats. So the top supported model for goats was the null, which tells us there's no relationship between what how you value how you um, the points you allocate to the seven values and whether you're gonna put money for goats. So none of these predictors were supported. For cattle and restoration, we had several top models. So we then did model averaging with those two scenarios and, um, used, and it gave us the best uh, predictors based on the coefficient values. Coefficient is, is the slope. So it just averages, it's the averages of all the coefficients were the better supported models got weighted more heavily. And so for the slope, and I'll, I'll show you this in a chart in the next slide, but if the slope came out positive, that means you had a positive relationship, it was negative, you had a negative relationship. And um, the, the steeper the slope, the, the stronger the relationship, uh, but also the, the slope, you know, plus or minus a standard error, if it crossed zero, there was no, no relationship. So I'll show you here on this next slide. So this, these are our seven values, right? Hunting, et cetera. And this is our cattle uh, scenario, management scenario, and our restoration management scenario. So the strongest support for the cattle uh, scenario, you know, are you gonna fund cattle, comes from native forest conservation here. I have it boxed in red. They have a negative slope, meaning it's a negative relationship. So th this, column here that says estimate, this, this is a slope, the coefficient. And plus or minus the standard error, it is above zero, so we know that there is a relationship. It's a negative relationship, so that which means that people that put that value native forest conservation were less likely to fund cattle. And again, with restoration, you look at native forest conservation, 
Here's the slope is a positive slope plus or minus standard error. It's above zero. So there is a relationship, the positive relationship, which tells us that people that support native forest conservation were more likely to put their money towards restoration. Kind of common sense, right? Um, the boxes in blue is, is lesser relationships, more marginal. So people that uh, support pineal heritage, they had a positive relationship for cattle. Here, restoration, folks who support rural lifestyle had a positive relationship with restoration. Hunting local food production had a negative re relationship. And again, with hunting, I'm not sure why local food production did, maybe it's associated with hunting. Um, but <clears throat> again, in the previous uh, results, we looked at hunting seems to have a negative association with restoration. And here we see the same thing where we have a negative slope, plus or minus standard error, it's above zero, there is a relationship. Um, so if people support hunting, we're less likely to support restoration and have a negative support for that. So for the um, conclusions, um, so for the interviews, hunters and cons folks that supported hunting and conservation the most, they were the most passionate groups in these interviews. For those that supported conservation, there seemed to be a bias for restoration and goats and a bias against cattle. For those that supported hunting, there is seen to be a bias against forest restoration. That's just what I got from the interviews. Looking at the data analysis, what we see the strongest relationship that I find for, uh, is native forest conservation. They show a strong bias for restoration and a strong bias against cattle. And then there is no bias for or against goats in any um in the in our last um analysis and also in the histogram just shows people just didn't fund goats right so what what does that tell us um one thing that tells me right off the bat is that if if Pua wants to um use targeted cattle grazing to reduce wildfire risk they may have a problem from the conservation supporters i mean these guys were um, passionate enough about it to contact myself and my advisors at various hours by phone call and email about this, you know, survey, they, they could, you know, contact their legislatures and go to public meetings and they seem to be pretty opposed to using cattle. And ironically, um, you know, conservation supporters support, you know, dry forest or native forest uh, protection. And this is, we're doing cattle grazing to protect these forests. Uh, so one one thing that that could be considered is outreach educational outreach to this group on the danger of dry forest and the or the science that shows that grazing is effective for reducing fire risk as far as supporters of hunters um yeah they they seem to support cattle but i don't think they care about cattle grazing enough to go out of their way to support grazing at puawa they they really don't like conservation because that removes um hunting areas so that's what they don't like and that's what they're gonna that's that's what i think what they're gonna act on uh, as far as goats really the fact that the null model is was came out on top um it just seems like the goats are not controversial so cow, cows don't work I mean, consider goats perhaps so as um for my discussion here um as far as Grazing at Puawa, it looks like that the ranchers are probably going to need some kind of incentive to do this. And this is something that has been brought up by the Puawa Advisory Committee over the years. That's the citizen group that advises management at Puawa. Um, you, one thing they could do is consider, consider grazing as a service. You know, when, you're, when you hire goats to graze down grass, you're paying them for a service. Although that's complicated by the fact that the ranchers are leasing public land. They are gaining value off of public land and selling cattle, uh, attempting to make a profit off of public land, although they don't make profit. So that, that's kind of a squishy situation there. There's also conflicting purposes. If you want to do targeted grazing, you got to understand that the rancher, their purpose is to graze for beef production and whatever other issue they have. You know, maybe their vehicle isn't available this day to move them and they got to wait till that day or whatever. Um, and the state wants to graze for fire risk reduction. And when you do targeted grazing, you're moving cows at a certain time for a certain amount of time at a certain place. It depends on what the fire risk is telling you. 
uh, you know, where, where you need these cows. So they're going to have to deal with these conflicting purposes if, if they want this to work. Um, also, this leads uh, kind of into a bigger picture I wanted to talk about early, um, is that this could be an opportunity to reframe grazing because ranching seems to provide other benefits besides just beef and um, fire risk reduction, especially amongst um, some of these ranchers. And again, I asked the question, well, why are you guys ranching if you're not making a profit? What are they, what are they gaining? Well, this, this may be part of it here. Um, the Cultural Ecosystem Service, that's just the non-material benefits that people derive from the human environmental interactions. And so this is this, these four values up here at the top in Hawaiian and English. Um, this comes from a recent paper that was done that broke down these cultural ecosystem services in a Hawaiian context in relation to these, these rangelands. And this was done with families in North Kona. And uh, so there's a lot more going on here than just beef production, right? So these four values, ike, knowledge. So they're gaining knowledge of the land, knowledge of just of being out on the land, how to live off the land. Um, the social interactions they're gaining, again, with the roundups, sharing beef with their social networks, the physical and mental well-being, and being, just being out in nature, um, getting exercise, uh, just working out there with, um, and the mana, this spirituality is, you know, be either they're self, being self-sufficient, gaining subsistence from the land itself, especially for some of the Hawaiian families, you know, land where their ancestors are buried. Um, so these are important values. And I, I've seen this, so in, in my interviews with people, I, I've seen some of these values come out or some of these, some of these na native Hawaiian ranchers are, essentially cultural practitioners. Um, but this, this goes back again to my question, why are they grazing? And, and this is part, I think, of why they're grazing. Um, so again, looking at uh, reframing ranching, um, again, this may be, at least at Puawa, an opportunity to integrate local food production with cattle with restoration, using the cows as a, um, a tool to reduce fire risk, keeping them out of the forest is, um, you know, fencing them out. Uh, but we can also look at ranching as a, like a cultural ecosystem service, perhaps, because one of the issues we have here in Hawaii is we've got the Department of Land and Natural Resources and the Department of Agriculture. And so even in our state laws and, and how we run our, how we do land management, it's, it's they're separate systems. How can we integrate that better? So this is something that we could consider doing this, not just a Puwawa, -wa, but statewide. And also looking at grazing uh, similar to some of the indigenous foodways, like there are Native Hawaiians that are restoring lo'i at Heia on Oahu and working with natural resource managers to restore wetlands. And so these folks, these folks are gaining subsistence from these lo'i from food and spiritual assistance from this, this practice. And it seems like something similar is going on with ranching, even though it's a non-native foodway and a non-native ecosystem that is threatening our forest. <laughs> so it's just kind of a, a different way of looking at grazing. Um, I guess my thoughts on this matter is grazing we can look at grazing through the lens of a non-indigenous foodway, perhaps. So anyways, this is what it is, and uh, we need to decide where we're going to take it. And with that, I'm gonna leave that here. Thank you all so much for your time. And funding came from DOFA, East West Center, and Native Hawaiian Student Services, yay. Thanks, Tanya. Any questions? Yeah, any questions for Tanya, you can uh, check into the chat. I know it's at 3 p.m., so you just made the, the list. Or sorry, the, the cutoff. The folks have to go. And again, I apologize. Sorry, for guys. For but if anyone has questions for Tanya, um, I can pull up the chat box, or you can try to read. You can also hand. email me, too, um, you know, if, if you know, you got to go right now. Yeah, but uh, and, uh, thanks, everyone, for hanging in there.
I don't know if everybody else is able to talk or not. I'm getting some chats. Yeah. Great job. Thank you so much. Awesome work. Thanks, Okay, because I don't see it. I yeah, see I've got it. I, I, yeah. Anyone? Cool. Uh... You're the man. <laughs> <laughs> you can stop the share and it, the chats will be easier to see. Oh, stop share. Okay, got it. Yay. Oh, hi, okay, everyone. I got a question. I got a question for you. Um, okay. Are the cattle raised from JB Friday, are the uh, cattle raised at Puwawa slaughtered locally to produce local food or are they used to produce calves for export to the mainland? Uh, it's a mix. Some of the ranchers do a cow-calf production where they do export to the mainland, but they're cull calves. So every year you cull animals from the herd. That's used by, eaten by the ranchers and their social networks. Uh, some of the ranch, one of the ranchers does do finishing grass, finishes them on grasslands and uh, ships uh, meat to like Whole Foods and into hamburger and stuff. It's a mix. I know that there's movement to try to get more, less shipment of calves to the mainland and have more slaughtered here in Hawaii, but it's just the scale of economics makes it difficult. So yeah, unfortunately we still have animals going to the mainland. Okay, one more, well, another question from Nikolai Barka. We're on Kauai. Do you think that the fact that goats were already present on the land affected people's decision to not allocate funding to goats? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, Cause the goats are already there. <laughs> um, but the goat, um, the y using targeted goat grazing is, is really different than just having goats randomly go over the land because the goat grazers, like the goat dozers at Akona, those are the ones I spoke to. I mean, they get them in there and they fence them in there and they graze pretty heavily and they move on to the next section and move on to the next section. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, that, that could have been part of it. You know, there's, yeah. there's several aspects of this study that, you know, we could have looked at differently. So. You had another, another question from Susan Cordell about goats, but I think you maybe got that. So let's go from Leah Bremer. Um, okay, I'll read it. What a cool study. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> from you. your interviews, are there any lessons for how forest restoration can be more inclusive of people? You mentioned including grazing as, fire, as a fire management strategy. Are there other ways, including agroforestry systems, that restoration might be less polarizing? Uh, and again, congratulations. I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, thanks. You um, need more I of this type of work. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really look at the agroforestry ag agri that much. I did look at some papers where they're trying to like restore ulu and various trees in the Kona area. Um, I think that's really cool. Uh, again, um, I mean, grazing is, I look at it as kind of a placeholder until you can restore the, the ra rangelands, especially in the more Malka areas. You know, they're looking to re restore more and more areas uh, in the Malka of Puwawa. Uh, I think eventually with climate change, you're not gonna be able to restore everything. You're just always gonna have rangelands in the Makai areas. Uh, as far as being less polarizing, um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, Puwawa is working with some of the Native Hawaiian families right now. I know that, that Elliot has been doing that at least last time I spoke to him about it, a few years ago. Um, but I, I think what Puawa is doing with the, their advisory committee and, we're, and reaching out to the community is really helpful. You just have to take the time to talk to people and in, include them as much as you can. That, that's what seems to be the, one of the issues. All right. Um, maybe we should close. There are a couple more questions here, um, <laughs> but I think that we also need to respect the time of her committee. So we're gonna get together a little bit after. Um, um, do you want to shoot me email questions? I will, I can yeah, I will to... shoot these questions to her um, if you guys, or I can pop the, you mind if I put your um, email in the chat? Yeah, put my email up there. It should be on my last slide, but I, we took that off. 